Today, I hope to offer a compliment to some of the more standard, conventional ways of understanding black poetry, poets, and poetics um, by putting an emphasis on sound and poetry. Now, you might be saying, yeah, okay, Tracy, right. We've heard of Baraka, Langston Hughes, Robert Hayden, Gwendolyn Brooks. We have a sense of black poetry might sound like, depending on the writer and how he or she performs a poetry. And that's, that's of course, what, what Shelley said about what figurative language was supposed to do. That it was supposed to derange through a connection that required a mental process of connecting to things that were unlike, uh, but had some sort of way of, of, of bridging that gap. Uh, but thank God that we have a story like Common Offers. I wish it was better known. Asha Trathaway does for us in her work is say, don't deny not just her name per se in some kind of autobiographical self-reflexive engagement in a kind of ego-centered artistry, but don't deny the names, right, or the idea of the selfhood, right, of these anonymous um, sex workers in these New Orleans brothels in Storyville, right? So Storyville somehow got to be more storied, right, than the women um, that worked and labored in it. And so that's something that I would argue that she's trying to um, upend and unend. If we can escape the categories, then we can achieve a lot of, you know, broader knowledge about what it is that we're actually doing. So part of the work, I think, of these poetics is to escape these fixed categories. So I think you're exactly right. I guess I wanted to sort of give you a distinction. Um, two sort of general camps, and these are not hard and fast, but just something we could work with right now. One is, I guess, sound, po sound as a flourish, and one is maybe sound uh, idiomatically. What I mean is that you have the type of sound that may add much to the impact or enjoyment of what you hear, but doesn't affect the meaning when the sound is left out. There's risk in every you know, uh, acquisition. That old saying, be careful of what you wish for. Yeah. We have wished for this recognition of, of this sort of inbuilt diversity in our musical approaches. Um, poetry has worked, I think, in a much more difficult um, genre, which is language, because that language was not being created by us. It was sort of being recreated by us. It has been challenged and added to, right? But I think that, but I think that this is how music has that greater fluidity that we refer to because it doesn't really have to explain itself in the ways that we think language, we think that mm -hmm. spoken word has to explain. The community did not approach a work of art saying, I wonder what this means. What if that work that the artists were doing was in, was in fact an organic <coughs> part of uh, what we think about on a day-to-day -day basis. This would be a very powerful difference in the way that we think about art, in the way that we think about ideas, and also the way that we think about ourselves. And move us beyond obvious sentimentality as criteria for excellence rather than simply whether or not it's in a book, right? So you have to back that thing up, as it were. When, when your students are just like, well, is it, you know, it's not about how it's published or if it's published. It's like, what traditions are you drawn on? What's the technique? What's the craft behind the oral presentation that you're, that you're offering us? Uh, which is a, a bit of an omnibus word to encompass a variety of different aspects of poetry beyond those words that, that appear or in, in, uh, in speech or on the page. And one is obviously the presentation context, which is where are you encountering that one? Are you encountering it in a print book? Is the print book coming from Norton, or is it coming from a small press? Uh, what is the small press? Different things are going to reach different audiences that way. And of course, nowadays, is it an electronic text? And does it incorporate digital animation, for instance? Is it spoken word? And if it's spoken word, does it incorporate some of these other 
media as well. So that's one. Another aspect is the, the literary history, the milieu in which the poem or the poems are created. So, uh, you know, traditional literary politics, you know, how does something become visible, as Jane Conklin says? How does it end up in an anthology or not? Uh, and in what anthology? I want to argue that in speaking to it, right, it's not just that it transcribes or describes it, but that kind of what Trethewey's verse does um, and what I would argue is a kind of imperative in the African-American poetic tradition is transforming it, right? Using the photographic image to transform the way that we see ourselves because historically the African-Americans within kind of early uh, daguerreotypy and photography um, often were so debased in terms of imagery. So that would be one um, aspect that I would um, I would emphasize. In all the work that I do, certainly in my teaching as well, I'm just as likely to be dissecting a, a Kaye West lyric as I am a, a Nikki Finney collection, uh, because I do think that there's a continuity of expression, particularly in our African American literary tradition, that connects the oral and the written, that connects these, and it connects song and poetry. The Greeks, of course, knew about this, and I wrote about that in, in Book of Rhymes, but I think any tradition that you go to, you see this intimate connection between the desire to sing and the desire to, to create poetry that one and the same, contiguous. Uh, and, and that's really what I hope to explore today. Some of the things I'm thinking about as an artist and scholar, I'm an, I'm an actress and scholar, and um, I'm always really amazed at how much I share in common with poets. Um, and what I'd like us to think about is the ways that the art forms of poetry and theater are very closely related. I mean, all the way to poetics, we can see those type of connections, right? So, um, but our art forms are often created in private, yet are intended for public display through acts of sharing on both really intimate and grand scales. And so the intersection of poetry and theater in African American culture for me is so pronounced that as a performer and teacher of acting, you know, I have to tell my students all the time, they have to really think about the ways, and this is students across racial lines, the ways that black poets in particular have written these counter public spaces um, that from plantations to street corners to simple stages, to proscenium stages um, as a way to announce and perform ourselves into existence. She saved me a lot of trouble when I heard her talking about how someone had tried to decipher the numbers as like programming language or Morse code to no avail. They don't mean anything, she said. I just typed some numbers. <laughs> now, she's kind of laughing at herself as well. She said, I guess I'm not really deep. Uh, the point, though, I would say, is that for Martin, the search for meaning in language is always full of frustration, misrecognition, and disappointment. But that doesn't mean she doesn't find or doesn't want us to find her writing meaningful. The significance of the work lies in her perhaps failed, perhaps not failed, struggle to make the language say a true thing, and in our willingness as readers to be vulnerable and generous in our engagement with the text. What does it mean to accept that we can't master her, the text of her poems? This is one of the questions her work poses for us. Uh, something that Howard said yesterday, which I found really interesting, is that Baraka today is as much a, uh, a, black, uh, uh, a black arts person as he was in the 60s. But you know, he sort of has refined it. Uh, and I think that's true. I hadn't really, I, I hadn't really thought about that. but there. And I think I was thinking about it as a contradiction, but it's not. It's just that there are certain elements, the positive elements of black art, uh, which he has, which he has kept. Uh, uh, it is uh, quite an honor to talk to uh, poetry scholars, uh, particularly about Alan Polite, uh, and to uh, talk to poets. Uh, I know many of you are accomplished poets, and I. Uh, am, am quite honored. So one of the purposes that I have here uh, today is to, uh, to try to uh, incite your interest in Alan Polite and some of the other poets that I'm uh, going to talk about uh, and hand over this, uh, this investigation 
of uh, African American poets in Scandinavia to, to very fine hands, very fine critics that you are. So I'm hoping that as, um, as we go along that your interest will peak and that you will uh, take up this charge. The best place to go is to this book that was published last year, which is online and, and openly available, called Debates in the Digital Humanities. And it talks uh, about, I mean, it has article, it gathers together many previously published articles um, on teaching, on research, on all kinds of issues within the digital humanities. So plenty of, of reading material there. But in general, I, I, I think of it as just uh, kind of the intersection of computers and humanities. So it could be um, using uh, computational tools uh, and methods from computer science to do humanistic, to, to look at humanistic questions. Uh, that could be text mining, uh, data visualization, GIS and mapping, um, looking at, and uh, Howard had mentioned big data, so lots of projects looking at uh, uh, data and trying to find patterns uh, through those. There is the artistic self-proclaimed magical activity <coughs> in Gwendolyn Brooks's poetry that would transform the narrating self and history. It is a stylistic uniqueness of body and voice that can be terminated in its most material form. Soldiers can be killed during any of several wars during her time, but not in the African-American and human spirit that literally informed her poetic form. While this imaginary is embedded within modern history, especially 1945 to 1968, it is part of a greater racial and human meta-narrative. <coughs> it is this elusive magic, especially 1945 to 1968, um, so repressed within modernity that her poetry especially reaches for. Despite the idealistic notions of such poetry, Brooks often suggests a need for poet poetic practicality. In other words, a social reconstruction or imaginative, not imaginary, transformation in the real world. Writers, he insists, must avoid the pitfalls of propaganda, uh, doctrinaire, uh, Marxian leanings, and the like. The task of this younger gen literary generation, he reiterates, is not to ignore or eliminate the race problem, but to broaden its social dimensions and deepen its universal human implications. Well, collectively, these three premises are both prescription and critique. Um, some people will tell you, and it's entirely a lie, that music is an entirely a, a non-connotative, it's not really a language, you know, it's just sound. Uh, no one in classical music would believe that because we have this whole category, you're in classical music, so you know what I'm talking about. We have this whole category called program music, things like Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique, where they literally tell a story using nothing but instrument, instruments. You hear a particular motif and it comes to play a narrative role. So it's clear that music is not just sound, it is part of a language. Language is not just semantics and syntax, by the same token. It's people revolving around, going to, come. we dance a while. And you know, I'm trained by Dunham, so hey, you want a Yon Valu? Okay, you ready? And, and what goes with it? Homage to Dambala, the serpent god, and so I'm a serpent. Double, double, toil and trouble, double dutch, too much, turning into trouble, trouble. Tapping time till we just can't take it, chants and rhymes till the moments make it, make it, make it. Blessed and cursed being double-handed, leaning to the left strand, definitely commanded. The understudies be understanding. Las brujitas switch be turning, dispel, casting, breaking curses through portal dimensions, simple phrases, making mischief not to be faded. Bracelets, clink, 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 clink. Bracelets, clink, 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 clink. Bracelets, clink and sink, think. Sweethearts, names, invocations through games and 
tell me the name of your sweetheart. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. Miss Lucy had a baby, a baby, a baby. Miss Lucy had a baby. And this is what she said. She said a store James Brown sitting in the gutter.